This is Big Man Tyrone, and you're about to watch the MTG Cabal cast with your hosts, Wode, Thirsty, and Reptar. Sub to us on all your podcast networks at MTG Cabal Cast and YouTube. All right, guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast, fresh off Eternal Weekend. I am hungover, but we are here. And we are going to cover Pioneer and what it means financially. Fresh hey, off Wizards of the Coast lunch, ending about eight minutes ago at 3 p.m. Pacific. Yep. And our first of who knows how many weekly ban restricted announcements for the format. Oh, yeah. So we got hit with Leyline of mm -hmm. Abundance, Oath of Nyssa, mm -hmm. and Felidar Guardian. Yes. So let's get started. All right. Um, so it seemed like a lot of people knew that something in the Sahili cat combo would go. I, I don't want to say no. I said they felt like it. Uh, a lot of people I talked to agreed with the Jerry Thompson tweet that said, now that Sahili is not your uh, character that you need to care about, it is not the card that's going to drive sales of the set, get rid of that and let people experiment with Felidar Guardian and what it can actually do in this, in this format. But they kind of reversed course. And I don't want to say rightly so, but, and I don't care about the reason they give because it's kind of chintzy. It's just yeah. that it does offer exploitation in the future with anything else that has ETB triggers similar to Sahili. It narrows the design space for them, and they like to cite that a lot. So I understand that I'm not happy about it. Financially, I don't think this does a whole lot to get rid of Felidar Guardian from that deck the card was like what a buck 50 two bucks at yeah. most foil copies and were actually pretty expensive but it seems like people were pretty uh bearish on them yeah and it's it's interesting too because you know sahili had taken off a little bit mm -hmm. but by and large you know the pink elephant in the room oko uh is already up i think like 12 ticks in the last 10 minutes uh and is rapidly approaching 90 again on moto yeah because Everyone thought it was going to get banned, as we tweeted out. Card Kingdom removed it from their buy list earlier today. Uh, I haven't actually checked it since the announcement went up mm -hmm. to see if it is back on there or not. Uh, it looks like it is not. We still have Oko the Trickster and nothing else. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it does much rather than add liquidity to cards that people were kind of holding on to pending this announcement. Yeah, it's just, we, like, Fill Out Our Guardian, I think, was a weird one to take in that instance. Like I said, I, I agree with Sahili because Fill Out Our, like Restoration Angel, has a unique element of play to it. But Sahili does one thing very specifically, and without the cat, it does. Sahili doesn't even do it that well. Yeah. So in favor of an, a more open design landscape, they got rid of the cat. Yeah. Boohoo. Uh, I don't even know what blew up from that deck in terms of price, if anything did. Some of the... Some maybe the unique lands did. Let me see what's in there. If there are temples in there, no. But everything else, mana confluence is in there. But that's not the deck that's going to push that one up. It's just the format as the whole. So it really wasn't propping up much that deck yeah. financially. They also got Leyline of Abundance, which I find pretty interesting. That to me seemed the most unique out of this BNR only because I hadn't seen Leyline do much. I mean, I know what it goes in, and I know what it can do, and it's... There are only four copies of it in the PTQ from this past weekend in Todd Anderson's deck, but I guess yeah. people are playing with that, Nykthos, Nyssa who shakes the world, and then just giant green dummies. Yeah. And it comes into play for free, and it adds two green pips. So it powers up Nykthos. But there are still four other Leylines in the format. So they just got the one that was played. Yeah. I mean, it, and I, the, I think it was the two decks of Green Devotion and Copycat had the most numerical 5-0 league finishes and yeah. have really high win rates against the field. So, like, sure, I get that. Um, it's interesting, though, to me that that's the case because the mono green list really started taking off in, like, the last four to five days. Yeah. And just exploded. Uh, so it was nice to, you know, I... For better or worse, I think this is a reasonable ban. I, I think it's fine as well. My only problem is, and I, note, I noted this over the weekend once uh, the top eight from the PTQ was done, is that there are a number of ways to build the mono green aggro list 
and nobody has solved that problem yet, so they banned a card before the puzzle had been pieced together. That's yeah. my only problem with this card. Again, they cite future design space and the fact that this adds two pips to Nykthos, but at the same time, like, Leyline of Anticipation is still in the format, and Mono de Blue Devotion is being played. Like, that deck doesn't use Nykthos right now, but it could. Are you going to ban the other Leylines just because for the same reason? It's just weird. And again, financially, this doesn't do a whole lot. Anybody who bought in on Leyline uh, cheap when we talked about it over the summer still gets to prosper because they're... That card yeah. has legs in standard. There was a goofy ass ramp deck that just played ley lines and elves, and so you could just start, you know, pumping out two two mana from each elf. So you untap on turn three or t on turn two, making four mana. Like, yeah, it. Even the foils seemed underpriced. I picked one up uh, at a store for like three this weekend, and knowing that it could see a ban in time in Pioneer, or it might not even show yeah. up at all in time in Pioneer. And I felt three was a fine hold on that. So yeah. I don't think this does much in regards to the mono green devotion deck and anybody who is holding these cards. I think you're you're fine there. And the nice thing about the green ley line is that it really only goes in that one deck. There's no splash damage on this. Yeah. Uh, and like they said, and similar to your point, that you know it ley line of it. So ley line hurts the deck without invalidating it. The yeah. way I think some cards would have yeah I, I, uh you know on that note i think that's having, a good way to look at it yeah yeah o hitting oath of nissa does disable a lot of these four color turn to nissa copycat lists yeah. that you had running around which you know now granted copycat's gone but you can't have just a four color good stuff um just because it's not easy no. with this mana base we don't have uh fetch lands to help float so you just have to use fast lands and hope you get all of your colors which mm -hmm. is not very reliable so yep and then the last card is uh ponder they got rid of oath of nissa because you can't yep. have ponder in any modern or forward format that isn't standard i guess so the end i was looking to see if the explanation for the banning of ponder, ponder and modern is very similar to what they uh cited here but it talks about efficiency and finding combinations. So this was the Storm ban. This is the 2011 Let's Ban Blazing Shoal, uh, Rite of Flame, Ponder Preordained, yeah. Green Sun Zenith ban. Uh, but Watsy just cites uh, synergies with three CMC Planeswalkers, which is a point I want to touch on, and consistency in finding uh, threats in either Planeswalkers or creatures. Which is whatever. You lose consist consistency across the format in copycat and i don't uh the i guess todd anderson's devotion style green deck used it but kind the of yeah mono green ramp deck did not yeah so again uh, you look at the top eight and you see a card that's just underrepresented there so i'm not yep. sure what the what the full fallout is uh i don't think i have the deck dump Oh yeah, I have the Pioneer list. Let me check this real quick. Oh, uh, thirteen decks, five vote with it within the first two weeks. An average of three point eight copies per deck, but that is uh, looks to be in the top thirty cards behind things like Lanoir Elves and Smuggler's Copter, Oko, Bomat Courier, Soul Scar Mage. You know, yeah. Spend, wait. Come on, consistency and three CMC planeswalkers. If the format lacks consistency, that's a design problem with the format, not a problem with this card. Trying to keep things yeah. consistent, and if you're citing three CMC planeswalkers and this card being too powerful together, then obviously your answer to three CMC planeswalkers is not fucking good enough. The end. I don't know if you remember the ban restricted announcement when they hit Git Probe and everything and Vintage. Uh, uh, didn't in they that hit announcement, it twice? they mentioned a Monastery Mentor like four times. Oh, yeah, yeah, the newest Git Probe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's the problem then, if you mention it four times in a BNR for another card. So the thing that I'm interested in seeing is them saying, look, three mana walkers were a mistake, uh, particularly the ones that are asymmetrical because 
to me, the problem is less copycat. It's copycat combined with Teferi. Yep. Because three fairy makes it impossible to effectively deal with. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I actually played uh, s and Saturday Night Magic this past weekend, <clears throat> mm-hmm. and I I knew it was going to be an extremely small field, and there would be there could be two Oko decks there. Both yeah. people who played Okos uh, went switched over to Fires, and man, Mystical Dispute is a hell of a card. But the problem yeah. is, it doesn't get all the three MC three CMC Planeswalkers in the format because you still have like Lily and Domri. And uh, oh no, Ashiok's blue. Both of them are, but yeah. like you have some uh, off-color three CMC walkers. Like, what are you gonna do? Like, I, I, t- you either make better answers or you, or you solve the actual problem. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah, you you can't have both. Financially, I don't think there's really much going on here. Like I said, that it smooths out copycat. It smooths out the. Uh, the mono green deck that Todd Anderson was playing, it gives yeah. him, it gave him the ability to basically to have a really aggressive draw with something like uh, Burning Tree. Yeah. Into uh, a, I, think, I think he had Gen- no uh, Voracious Hydra, or if he didn't want to take Voracious Hydra off an Oath and he wanted to switch gears and needed to play more of a defensive game, then he could pick up Coursers and things like that off Oath and allowed him to play multiple Whichever. yeah from multiple f- fronts in the same deck. It, it yeah. didn't hamstring him into just hoping that he drew what he needed. It actually gave him additional looks aside from Once Upon a Time. Yeah. Are they going to get that card too? It costs zero or two. I think across the a game it probably averages like 1.6 if you cast yeah. it on turn one. You know, yeah. you're going to take away all the cards that smooth things out or are you going to deal with some of these three CMC walkers that can just take over a format because your answers to them aren't good enough. Like... And, and Abrupt Decay is a good answer. Oh, it absolutely is. you don't is. have to cast it at sorcery speed. Yeah. But the other thing about Abrupt Decay is there are at least two cards that remove that card from the stack. They don't counter it, they just straight remove it from the stack. You have Spell Queller and Aether Gust. Yeah. And, you... uh, and then, hang on. Does Veil of Summer? Yeah. Hexproof from blue and, and from black. black. Yeah. So Veil. Yep. Yeah. So your answers to protect your 3MC walkers are stronger than the answers to the 3CMC walkers. So you can just climb the chain and eventually just say some of these 3CMC MC, three walkers need to go. Teferi is seen in more decks than Oath. Oko seen in more decks than Oath. Yeah. Make... But it just changes the landscape. So now people are going to switch into some of these other decks, and eventually they might see bands there. It's just going to keep pushing people down as they kind of cut off some of these side strategies and, and other ways to play the format. If, yeah. they, if they cut Oko loose and they cut Sahelia loose, all that really takes care of is the copycat deck and the Simic bullshit strategies. Nexus of Fate won the PTQ. There was one Oko in the sideboard. In the last two weeks, Oko has won every major competitive event from won... standard all the way to vintage. Yeah, it won all three events at Eternal Weekend this weekend. Mm-hmm. And it won uh, G- uh, Magic Fest Leon this weekend. And the only reason it didn't win Modern with this weekend because the Modern event was last weekend. <laughs> I mean, did you see the top eight? <laughs> no, it, was, it was almost mono Oko. Seven Okos and a blue-white control list. Good job. I mean, the legacy top eight was six Delver decks, but at least there were like two different variants. Yeah, there was Bug, Forcey, and Rug. So yeah. you know. Uh, uh, is it? Oh yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah it was in the finals, yeah. right? But so like, it... Oath of Nissa is probably the one that does the most financially because it's going to push players who are playing mono green into like very specific lists, and that's going to prop up cards that just weren't seeing play right away. It's going to yeah. change the context of those decks. Those decks. So if you wanted to play Ramp now in uh, the second place, or sorry, the other top eight deck, you might slow things down a little more, despite the fact that Oath wasn't there. Your The deck that Todd Anderson was playing, the aggro style, might begin to slow down as well, and they might yeah. coalesce down into something a little more, one might be a little more mid-range, and the other one might just go full-on Ramp, and yeah. it will go over the top of the other one, but you're going to see decks kind of coalesce around now like Nykthos and elves once upon a time is still there and a lot of the threats are still going to be the same because they provide pips for nick though so you're going to see uh coalescing on courser and you might yeah. see uh not obvious maloth uh castle garen brig 
Yeah. And things like that. I think that's one that may see some more play now and then, because it helps make up for the speed you're losing. Yep. And then with both of those decks, they're, uh, the top end threats in either Emrakul or Ulamog are right yeah. there as well. I think Todd had an, an Ulamog in a sideboard. The, the other person had one in the main. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And you're going to see these decks come together. So it squeezes those, those archetypes and it's going to prop up these other things. This doesn't yeah. really say, like, oh, now Abzan has a chance to play, so things like Thoughtseize and Siege Rhino, 6CMC Elspeth, Lily Last Hope are going to go up, or Kolagon's Command and some of the other Jund pieces. Yeah. No. It just... The format stays where it is, and we lose Copycat. That's it. That's all this band did. Yeah. So. Which, financially, meh, whatever. No. I, not, I th not a lot. No. Uh... I think the band does more for cards that weren't on it and other strategies. So yeah, like I got rid of my dig through times and abrupt decay. Not uh, death by shaman and abrupt decay I mentioned last week because I knew yeah. they weren't going to go anywhere, and, uh, and both in regards to the format right now and price. But what I waited on was my dig through times. Dig isn't on yeah. this list, so people who want to play dig are now gonna, and were hesitant to spend like the four dollars a card. I now are going to go back and buy into dig. Yeah, that dig but price I don't is know if it's going to be four dollars a card anymore. Exactly, you might not because see it, it dodges the band hammer. Yep, and you might see a trend up to six and more. Uh, we talked yep. before the cast about how like Jace Friend's Prodigy not that great, but you know what? The Rude Awake, um, it makes Rude Awakening. Uh, J uh, Just Guy Ascendancy plus the what the hell is the, the name of that style of card? The Saga. Yeah, the sagas. Uh, the Green Saga that turns all your lands into two twos. Yeah. You build your own Rude Awakening with Jeskai Ascendancy, so you still play four color. That deck isn't going to play Oath because it can't find Ascendancy and it can't play and it can't find the Saga. Yeah. It doesn't care about that card. It cares about things like Dig Through Time and uh, certain pieces of ramp, so you can actually play your Sagas and everything else ahead of Curve. Yeah. You might, we might see Jeskai Ascendancy go up. That unlo It unlocks that card in essence. I don't think Treasure Trees is going on because there are infinite copies of that card. It was reprinted. Yeah. It was like, I think it was a Commander card and it was in... Um, Uma, Graveyard Masters, yeah. right? Yeah. Just where Dig was. They put those two in there. And there's like the goofy Chromantic or Soul Flare deck. That with this stuff yeah. gone might actually be able to do something for once. I was joking about it today. Saffron Isle took that list to a 5-0 list and it said this was a thing in standard, but you couldn't get it above a 40% win rate. If you can, both those cards should skyrocket from bulk to a few dollars. Like, Soul Flare is not a bad card to have in general. Like, no. It's so unique. For what it does yeah so even if this deck doesn't become a thing it's probably not a bad pickup at dirt and it's you know it it's the type of thing that i mean we sold out the day pioneer was announced and i have no idea what it's at now i know what it yeah it's back down to like 20 ish cents yeah for tcg low uh it's the type of thing that every now and then or sorry a dollar 37 for tcg low every now and then i'll spike up to five dollars <laughs> and you can find it on a buy list for three bucks at that time so it doesn't hurt anything to have it, and it's got EDH appeal, and uh, stuff like that isn't going anywhere. No, no. They're not going to reprint Soul Flayer again, I would think, anytime soon, but, you know, we'll see. No, not at all. And I, I think this this doesn't really change the viability of Mono Red in the format. I just think Mono Red is going to be a deck to continue to watch. Yeah. Uh, you, you can go bigger into Hazard like we talked about, or you can stay low to the ground with things like Soul Scar Mage. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, with copycat gone because you couldn't really burn out Felidar Guardian and you couldn't really go to the face on a, easy enough to see Healy you can see uh, that come up and then uh, everything in the Nexus deck that just won yeah. I just picked up a Nexus for $8 which I believe is still around market like if that's the case nope it shot the fuck up yep so disregard right. Yeah, it's all-time low was ten dollars fifty cents October twenty-first. It wins the PTQ and it immediately doubles. Ah, like, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool story. Thursday yeah. is fourteen. Monday it's twenty-five. Yeah, nineteen on uh, Saturday night. Like that deck also plays Wilderness Reclamation, which right now has climbed to about two dollars, and I believe it plays the Simic Temple, which is another good place to uh, yeah to look at uh if you if you're looking for those temples that's going to be one of the reasons it's going up or a good reason to get out of them soon uh, yeah either way reading pool and i think that was it i don't think it played a whole lot else in that yeah i think that was all of them and i don't think it's a turbo fog grind but it does 
but it is going to be something that's going to push the format. If you can't ascendancy combo, this is really the only combo you have left. Just yeah. kind of womp through people. And it... I don't know. Yeah. It, it'll... I think this is probably one of the most impactful bannings they've made in a while, maybe not financially, but I definitely think we'll start to see some changes here because of it. Yeah, it, it's hard to kind of gather my thoughts about this because it happened so late in the day and we thought about it and I really only rolled around the Felidar Guardian Sahili stuff from over the weekend because it was a, a conversation I had with a number of people who asked me about yeah. it. Yeah. And the only thing I said was one of the something from that deck was going to go but Dig Through Time was not, and those were my only views on what was going to happen because I didn't think anything else needed to happen with this format. So, yeah. So financially, it's just kind of a, a crapshoot. Like, yeah. You know, it, it the the format's still all over the place, and you like, boy, this, is it. This next this Nexus deck, man, I can guarantee you, like, Thing in the Ice is up because of it. Like that was yeah. stocks this morning, Cyclonic Rift. Is going to go, is going to be up because of it, yeah. And then after it pushes search and it pushes Tamio, it does. You know, two other cards that were just kind of middling for a while, yeah. And Veil of Summer, of course. Yeah, I well, so it's interesting you say that. Uh, well, I guess we we can discuss my opinions there uh, at at the pick section. I mean, we can just go right in. I don't know if there's a whole lot more to talk about financially because we're still in a scramble. It's just, yeah. If you haven't bought your dig through times, your Jess guys, and you like that's a card you want to play. Your Jess guys, and it's because you want to play it now, 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 now. All this stuff yeah. is going to go up, and we know we're now doing this late in the day, but it's as soon as we can do it, absolutely the time. Yeah, yeah. That's the best piece of advice we could really give you prior to our picks for this episode. Yeah, agreed. Hands down. Maybe in a couple of weeks, Oko will be gone, and we can actually analyze the format and talk about cards you can play that are creatures, yeah. that aren't elks, or I'm mox, telling, yeah, knows? or or mox jets that aren't elks and lotuses that don't swing for the win. Uh, yeah, Joe's a good guy, though. Glad he won. Anyways, oh yeah, uh, picks. Would you like to start, or you want me to? I uh, guess I guess we'll transition because it's your pick. Yeah. So. I went for Veil of Summer. So for those of you that don't know, October 31st, the Japan-only Challenger decks released. Now, of note in these decks, two Hydroid Krasis, three Dreadhorde Arcanist, three Veil of Summer. So hmm. Hydroid Krasis and Arcanist specifically were Japan cards. They were cards that, due to arbitrage, metagame, whatever... Their value was floated by the Japanese market, which is why when you went to a GP, TOA usually had them on the hot list for TCG low, because that was a profitable price to send them over to Japan or China. Yep. Uh, similar to Veil of Summer. Veil of Summer this weekend was on TOA's hot list for, I believe it was $4. Yes. Uh, and that was basically at the time, you know, TCG low. Uh, it's now going to be about $5 on, I believe it's Columbus, is what I'd expect to see it at. Mm -hmm. So the reason this is relevant is because those prices in Japan, which was the marketplace for these cards, including Veil of Summer, is going to crash now. So not right now, but in probably, I'd say, about three to four weeks, so pretty much in the heat of the holiday lack in the market, mm -hmm. uh, you'll start to see Veil of Summer decline. And at that point that's when I would suggest getting into it because it is a card that is good in vintage. Mm -hmm. It's good in legacy. It's good in modern. It's good in pioneer. Uh, Cedric had a great Twitter rant about it and it's good in standard. Yeah. It's something that I don't think they're going to reprint anytime soon because they literally just printed it. Yep. And I think it's fine to get in for about eh, three ish dollars, you know, yeah, if you're lucky enough to find them right now, they're about you know six fifty, uh, according to, to uh, or six thirty according to stocks, and uh, Hararuya yeah. has English copies for about nine hundred. JPY eight hundred JPY for uh, the Japanese. Like, yeah. At this point, if you can uh, if you can find them that cheap, get them. It's, yeah. 
I don't know. It's a very interesting card. I, that was probably the only card I spent time thinking about going into Standard on Saturday. Because I haven't played Standard at all for a while, but I knew that it didn't matter how many green decks were going to be there, everyone would have Val of Summer. Yeah. So you have to play around that card, and it makes you play a completely different game once you know it's coming in against you. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous. The There's also an interesting aside where in the Legacy Top 8 of Eternal Weekend, and I don't have the deck list for this, and I feel bad about it, I believe the Storm player had Xanted Swarms in his list Z against Rug Delver, which isn't a yeah. bad card because you just enter combat, swing with it, and it doesn't matter if it dies in combat, green light, go. All yeah. you need is that trigger. But if it dies before combat... You pooped, right? Yeah. Veil of Summer works for your entire turn. And it's for every spell thereafter. So yeah. if you're just in the market to j to dismantle your opponent's hand and cast it over something like Xanted Swarm out of your sideboard, it actually ha has a home there as well. Yeah. So it, it has the ability to take over similar spots for a number of cards for a number of cards like uh what's the other one i was thinking of not uh the matrix is it damping matrix damping matrix yeah you know uh spells you play on your opponent's turn cost three cmc more like oh defense grid. More. defense grid yeah yeah defense grid sorry yeah and that that is symmetrical yeah that is, so it basically it comes in to four uh as a storm player somebody's going to be comboing on their own turn and it takes you a number of spells to get there, you have to have a critical mass, so to speak. You can't just wade your way through with a bunch of test spells. And a Veil of Summer also works there as well, if you can land that Veil of Summer. Yeah. Because it just takes care of the rest of the turn. May you the other them. nice thing is that Veil does not die to Bolt, that, yeah. whereas Xanad Swarm does. Exactly. So I, I think we're seeing the beginning of Veil of Summer in a lot of the older formats. It just slots in naturally to a lot of places, and we saw it naturally in those places. I think yeah. we'll see it in more places. But as we move into the holiday season and people are starting to crack more packs, if Star City does their uh, liquidation again on M20, yeah, you know we'll see more copies open, market floods a little bit, and on and on. It also was like one of the largest chunks of EV for that set. Yeah, I it was for once a good core set with value on commons. Yeah, which hasn't happened since like tenth edition. So, yeah, I want to check this real quick. Sets, that's what I need. Uh, no. Yeah. Core twenty twenty. Sort by price. Descending. Yeah, it is one two three four five six seven. The seventh most expensive card. In Corsa 2020, it's now above Field of the Dead. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, oh, joy. it sits in a nice average. Like everything else that holds a decent amount of value floats around eight to five. So yeah. It's not bad. It's there. a good like middle ground value format. Yep. No, it, it's good. Like this is one of the only cards I sought after from this set. And if you plan on playing any format in Magic this card get it get this card yeah so uh i can't say that as fervently about my card about my pick for the week my my just a little more interesting based on uh, uh some some other analytics and uh typecasting but uh, the card i'm picking for the week is temple of plenty this is the green white temple out of born of the gods yeah so when i was coming through the the 5-0 lists to see what people had been playing over the last couple of weeks just to pull specs for myself. I, I honed in on the temples because I have a handful of extras. And I noticed that Temple of Plenty was the second most played temple behind the Blue White Temple. And the uh, both of those were in a very similar number of lists. Obviously, it was like Jeskai Ascendancy or Control list for the Blue White one. And it's a hexproof list for the Green White one. Yep. But we're looking at two temples, both of them, were not reprinted. We could see them in Theros Beyond Death. There's there's that option where they complete the cycle. But as as I showed in Socks, this is just a very slow rise over time yeah. from bulk to the almost $3 price tag it has now. 
there is a green white hex proof list in Pioneer right now. It 5 0'd a couple weeks back. Uh, no, not even. November 1st. So over this past weekend, it 5 0'd in a league. Yeah. And, you know, there are diehard Bogles players. You know, Bogles all formats. So with only one printing at $3, this is a card that if you can find it in binders, I would pick up pick it and up. yeah and hope to get out before we get the land cycle for theros which should be late spoiler season which starts in a couple of weeks i believe i think yeah richmond is the boosters and it's yeah. this weekend Rich yeah so, richmond is this weekend and it's the collector boosters or whatever so yeah so i don't know if we'll or get mystery boosters whatever. sorry uh, it doesn't matter it's all poop yeah uh, if we get yep. the Anything from Theros Beyond Death there that wasn't leaked, or if we just get a clean version of all the leaked cards, and then stuff later on. But until we know that this card is in the set, I think it's a straight heater to pick up in binders. If you can find it in stores for anywhere near TCG uh, market or low, I, I would pick it up because it will just be a slow gainer over time. Yeah. I believe the temples when they came out the first time, and I was rewarded because these are EDH cards they were played in modern for a little bit the blue white blue black in the adnos yep. deck like they were there the green white one and the yeah, the there's not so much yeah but we have a brand new format with brand new archetypes where this is a premier lands because there is no draw to this you do not have uh any way to accelerate you have no way to smooth without yeah you know, there's no other so you need something and this is going to be it and I think, I guess, if it's reprinted in Theros Beyond Death, it probably does what the uh, core temples did, which was tanked to about a dollar. Yeah. But it'll come back up. We've seen these uh, rebound before, and the demand is there. Market and average have basically been intertwined for the last almost a year on this card. Yeah. So, obviously, it's there. It's just a slow mover because there hasn't really been a reason to generate demand. Now we have yeah. one. It, it hasn't been there, and like you said we've seen them reprinted before and they gradually cycled back up i think the other thing too is you know the old adage of mana bases are the most expensive part of every format yep. so unless they print it into the ground i expect that we'll see pioneer start to get towards a more slowed down mid-range type format and when that happens temples are perfectly viable oh absolutely uh, and i mean they're they're already viable now because you're seeing them in lists mm -hmm. but They'll be more viable the longer that goes on, and especially since we don't have the full cycle of fast lands in the format. We have shocks, we have temples. That's it. Yep. All right. Pain lands? Yeah. Wait, is Origins in this? Yes, I can't is. remember. So yes, you have the yes. enemy yeah, so pain lands. lands. Sure. Yeah. The, but the same that's... problem that people have been complaining about with pain lands and moderns. The same price we have. The same problem we have with pain lands in Pioneer. However, now with this new format, it. Watsi could be a little more inclined to give us Carplusion Forest and a Dark Hour Waste and uh, all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'll it'll be interesting to see. I think I I like the pick. I think that long term it's a very good one, even if short term there's you know no good comes from it and ends up getting reprinted. Yeah. And like you said, worst case, just get rid of them in the next like two to three weeks. Oh yeah. Uh, and they are. And I, I can attest, I've personally seen them sitting in trade binders and people are like not even looking it up because it's such a low dollar value that they're just like, ah, it's like a dollar or two. It's fine. Yeah, because we're they barely were... off on the trade. Let's yeah. call it even. 2016 to 2019, Temple of Silence, the black white temple, which was reprinted at Core 20, was between a dollar thirty and two dollars. Yep. Nobody's going to care that much. If you need to even something out, and they lose a little bit on that temple, yeah, it did spike to three fifty, and now it's down to two fifty. But that's for a card that was reprinted in a core set in the last year. Yeah, it's holding at two fifty. So even if this temple gets reprinted, we do have, you know, a case in point where we can see it will take a dive, but it will hold fairly stable for a little while while the market catches back up to it and they're absorbed. Yeah. So, so good, good solid pick, I think. Yeah. It also works out well with Starfield Mystic because we know we're getting uh, enchantments back. Yeah. So green, white in that color, and that was 
Not the heroic deck from before it was blue white, but you never know. Yeah. There was the green white devotion deck, the one that spun its wheels with uh Pelucranos, was it? No, no, the the enchantment that made manifests. Oh, uh Unseen Mastery. Yeah. Yeah. Like that one. You could see something dumb like that, at which point the temple is you know, a cornerstone for that mana base. Yeah, very true. So But not, Solid. Yeah, and you know, I think that's really all there is right now. As the as we go forward this week, you know, I'm sure you'll see some more hot takes from us on Twitter, just because things are going to change and people are going to complain. And you know, eventually, somebody who's testing for that emergency handbrake 180 that was the Star City shift of the Invitational yep. from standard to modern should put up some interesting screenshots of what the hell is going on right now in Pioneer. So I yep. would also keep up with that. And uh. Card Kingdoms by us will update tomorrow night, guaranteed. I'm sure. Yeah. Yep. It's not on there yet, but it will be. No, but if you're somebody like me who's just chomping at the bit to get rid of Dig Through Times, you got to wait till people buy out Card Kingdom of Dig Through Times. Yeah, because in that, order to get in back in on it. Yeah, because sure. that price has been a buck fifty for almost two weeks now. Yeah, which is I'm waiting. Far too cheap. Exactly, especially for a card that has a four dollar market price. Yes. Yeah. So pretty rough so we will definitely keep you guys informed on twitter and if you become a patron you'll stay up to date in the discord which was pretty memey all day it was great oh yeah so uh for for this episode i am at halt i am reptar on twitter i am at thirsty sizzler we are at mtg cabalcast on twitter and patreon and facebook and we the Uma giveaway is still going on, and we are trying to figure out exactly what 2020 is going to look like for our giveaways. But once we know, we'll tell you. We'll have it on the Patreon, and they will be much more frequent oh, yes. in all likelihood. So stay tuned for that. See you next week. See ya.